Cool. Um, thanks very much for coming, everyone. Um, we're going to get started pretty promptly because we've got a lot of content to get through and uh, everyone's got quite a schedule today, I'm sure. Um, so thank you for coming. This is a talk on API evolution with CRDs, so um, best practices for authoring CRDs, fuzz testing, all sorts, and like how to maintain, uh, how to maintain your CRDs. So I'm James Monley. I'm a field engineer at Apple. Um, it kind of means I do all sorts, and this is my co uh, colleague here. Hi, hi, hello everyone. I'm Andrea Tosato, working at SRE at Apple as well uh, with James. We both work on the Kubernetes platform at Apple. And this talk is really like about like our journey like internally in like uh, building, authoring, and, and also like advising partner teams on how to extend the API using CRDs. And the journey with CRD is actually like start really like with the authoring part, right? Is it's like any API, like when you get like to design it and implement it and think like how to do things, the first challenge is really like about the modeling. Um, in, in the context of Kubernetes, there are a lot of examples, right? In the community, the community is quite big. Uh, at times, too many. It can be overwhelming, like to find like the right information, the best practices. Best practices. Something that to me is also quite funny is that often, like when we write code, we used to look into the standard library as a reference on best practices. But Kubernetes has been here very long, and not always like the core resources are the best representation because there are some trade-offs, and the community evolved their understanding on the API. Uh, so maybe not always the core resources are the right place to look at on how to implement things. Um, and also, like there are also other challenges related to the design of the CRDs, right? In do we model everything in one single resource? Do we use more? And uh, actually, like Kubernetes gives us like this object ref. Uh, field, oops, object field, which help us like to break up CRDs, but at the same time uh, really increase the complexity of controllers because now you need to start like uh, handling into the code like these these references and as well create cognitive overhead for the users. Uh, but generally, like one one best practice that we learn is that it's it's really worth like breaking down like the model into more. Uh, resources itself, and a good example, if you think about it, is like the certificate resource, for instance. Like you have one resource, the map 101 to certificate, or as well as well, like as for instance, like external secrets, the map like to one concept, and then you can build the resources like that group all together these entities into, for instance, a concept like a store. Um, so yeah, I think there's, as Andreas says, once you kind of think about what your concepts are. Uh, and you think about kind of like where, uh, where you have all these different concepts and how they relate to each other. You then obviously get onto probably the, the, probably the thing you actually do first, which is actually writing a schema. Um, and writing a schema can be quite difficult. It takes time to evolve it. You make mistakes as you go. Um, and yeah, I think one of the first things that you then need to, uh, sorry, as you're, as you're doing this, uh, the API convention stock, which I think most of you probably, I'd hope, have seen. Um, you should definitely go check out. Uh, it's really exhaustive, and I, this is kind of like the reference manual for best practices for like what, uh, what, what a Kubernetes feeling API is like. And that, you know, building it like this makes it feel more natural. People understand more, um, kind of like what, uh, like people more naturally understand the resources and so on. And I think uh, one of the things that I always say here is really kind of focus on talking to the community about these things because. It's very, very hard. As Andreas says, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, people make mistakes as they go, though. Um, V1 APIs still have problems in them. Pods have been around for years. Um, so I think reaching out to the community is really a big, big first step. Um, so writing a complete schema. It's required for V1 CRDs now. Um, we should stop talking about V1 beta 1 CRDs uh, because it's, you know, it's a thing of the past. We should be looking forward. Um, it enables really useful things. kubectl explain. Who knows kubectl explain here? or has used it before, yeah? So that, that, it's a really nice CLI. Um, you just kubectl explain your resource name, and it will actually go and explain to you all of the different fields that you can uh, specify. Your descriptions are pulled through there. You can uh, display kind of like what the valid values are, all of these sorts of things. Um, you can make sure that you've actually got a full and complete schema by looking at the conditions on your CRD. So a kubectl describe on your actual CRD resource will show you those conditions. Um, and once you do this, You've got far better validation. The API server can uh, kind of actually 
evaluate all of your resources as they're submitted by your end users um, and make sure that they're valid, that they you know, don't have any typos in there, which is actually a really common problem we see. Um, people, e even capitalization or just the wrong word. If users don't know that there's an error there, they end up pushing these things out and they might make assumptions about how their application or their resource is gonna work that just don't hold true. Um, and yeah, this, as it says, matches the behavior of other core built-in types, which I think, for me at least, we're good. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important piece there because people kind of become familiar with Kubernetes. It's already complex. We want to really reduce that cognitive overload and overhead. So what can we do with open API schemas? First of all, as it says, we can actually uh, perform all this validation, defaulting, without expensive network round trips to uh, webhooks, validation webhooks, mutation webhooks, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, you've got quite a lot of flexibility here. Things like max length on strings. It seems really like small, but if you don't set, specify a max length for these things, you can have a completely unbounded amount of data up until the etcd limit, which can become really problematic. Uh, same with lists, items. We've seen people accidentally insert 10,000 list items into a huge list, and that can be really problematic too for the API server, especially when you look at managed fields and some of these more advanced server-side apply stuff. Minimums, maximums, just helps users once again. Um, regexes for strings, we can do all sorts there too. Uh, enum values to actually make sure that the values that's our user, that your users specify are valid and make sense, and that makes your controller code far, far simpler to write, because you're not having to deal with all of these kind of other, uh, deal with values that are unknown. Uh, CEL, uh, who's heard of CEL here as well? Yeah, common expression language. Um, so this is uh, out of Google, I believe, and um, originally, um, and it, it, it allows you to do some really, really advanced stuff with uh, your CRDs and far more, uh, uh, far more validation. So here you can see um, we can do like comparators. We can say one field has to be greater or less than another and things like that. We can check to make sure that certain values are within certain lists and so on. Um, you've even got set operations in there and making sure that things are immutable. So self equals equals old self, make sure that we can't change anything. So defaulting, uh, yeah. If you have a resource, someone submits it. If you think, uh, think a pod, uh, sorry, a deployment or something, when you create that, if you don't specify the number of replicas, we can default that to one because you probably do want that to not be zero, like it's that, that kind of intent. When a user reads that object back, they can then see that they've got replicas one. If we don't have defaulting, it might be unclear to users when they actually go to inspect their resources what the actual, uh, what, what, what's actually going on there. Image pool policy is another example. You know, if you didn't know, and you didn't just happen to know, new users are really not gonna know what the behavior is gonna be. Um, doing defaulting in your schema as opposed to in webhooks and so on, means that you can, uh, these things can actually be applied on read operations as well. So if you have resources that were created previously, you can then still make sure defaults are applied. Um, and yeah, just one other little tip for kind of making APIs that don't confuse people. Um, having fields that default based on the value of another field can lead to really kind of tricky, confusing cases for people because they might submit one thing which then changes there, and then you have like server-side apply kicks in, another user, and another entity starts setting things, and then that changes stuff up, and it gets really confusing. So just as a best practice, keep your defaults simple as well. So that leads on to a pretty, pretty chunky topic, which is versioning and conversion, which I'm gonna try and take us all through today. Who knows about how, how I can't really do one to 10 with the whole crowd, but how do you feel about versioning and conversion? Have you looked into it before? Everyone raise your hands if you have. Yeah? Okay. Cool. So, versioning is a really, really fundamental principle in Kubernetes. You've seen v1 beta 1, we've seen v1. You've probably suffered the pain of these APIs being deprecated before as well and removed and had to deal with all of your users going through it. But at its core, uh, an API version is an API, is an a endpoint that gives some kind of guarantee that if you go and submit a resource today to this endpoint, it will continue to work in future. It, we won't change like, the language, the schema, and the shape of that resource. Um, the difference between kind of alpha, beta, GA here, um, alpha, no rules at all. So I, like, I would, we have had to really kind of strongly discourage people relying and leaning onto these alpha 
uh, APIs. Beta, similarly, we might not change the schema in a breaking way. However, you, like that resource can go away too. We can still remove that within a few releases. And like stating that up front with your users makes it a lot clearer. And to be honest, again, be careful with beta APIs because a migration where you're actually removing something can be super painful because users come to rely on certain functionality and features. Um, we haven't seen a GA API go away yet, as far as I'm aware. We haven't done Kube Kubernetes 2.0, but you know, CRDs, they can move a lot quicker. You know, you've got your own project, so yeah, possibly we'll see that at some point. Has anyone ever removed a GA API from their thing? Cool, nice. That's good, I guess, ish. Um, so yeah, conversion enables the API server to kind of, uh, and in fact, I've got a nice diagram here. Um, it enables the API server to help coordinate different clients that are working at different versions. So here you see in etcd, it's hard for me to point. Up in etcd, all objects are stored in some API version. So in this instance here, we've got the storage version set to v1 beta 1. That means as a user submits something, they could speak v1, v1 alpha 1, v1 beta 1, whatever. The API server will handle converting that into the storage version, v1 beta 1, persist that into etcd, and then from there, um, if any other client asks for it in a different version or anything like that, it can then it can handle that translation. Um, you can see here in internal in like internal core types, we have uh, the idea of like an internal version and a hub, and, um, which uses the hub. So every, we write conversions between our external versions that users use and this internal one. Controller runtime is similar, except it just gets away, get rid of the concept. It gets rid of the concept of um, of the internal version, instead just uses one of those external ones as its hub, which is kind of a little bit less to think about and deal with. So yeah, what can we do with CRDs here? Because the API server obviously compiles on a lot of this code, and we need to actually make sure that we're, um, we, 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 we can't compile code into our API servers when we're using CRDs. So first of all, nothing at all. Um, we can keep everything v1 alpha 1, or we could call it v1 from the start and be really careful. I think that's probably a pipe dream, really. Um, no op conversion. I know in the gateway API, they've been really trying to push for, let's call this v1 alpha 1, but uh, you know, let's try and treat it like v1 and go for a no op conversion so we don't actually do any conversion. We'll see how that goes. They haven't got to v1 yet. But um, you know, I think it's not, a bad, it's not a bad way to do it, and it really forces you to think about your API up front, too. Conversion webhook. Who's used a conversion webhook or built one? Who loved it? Yeah. Um, conversion webhooks introduce a lot of operational risk. It's on the hot path for read operations from your API server. So that means things like, uh, well, yeah, first of all, we need to actually make sure they're reliable and running all the time. But it really is an extension of your control plane. So if you've got a team that manages the control plane, they really need to know about the conversion webhooks that are running. Because that can like breach SLOs. It can breach everything. It can really, you know, bring a cluster down. Um, so yeah, great escape hatch if you do need to do something, but in the Cert Manager project, we had a conversion webhook for a number of releases. I'm really glad to say we don't have one anymore. Uh, we have V1 resources, and I'm really reluctant to actually ever introduce it again, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's critical, API server dependency, like we say. And uh, also, I think a lot of companies and a lot of teams don't actually have a lot of experience running these, and they don't fully know what those risks are. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Key takeaways, try and make sure that you're like keeping this for as little time as possible, I'd say. Really, really push through with your conversions. Like, if you, I, keep it one release. We made the mistake of having conversion webhook for about seven releases, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of pain. Um, and also, I would say consider publishing V1 only variants of your CRDs too. For those that actually don't need all of that legacy, new users, for example, they can just start with V1 today if they're picking up your project. Um, and yeah, just quickly before I hand it back over to uh, Andrea, there's been some really interesting work in the KCP project, um, which some of you may have heard of. It's uh, talking about using common expression language, again, CEL, to actually define your conversions in a declarative way on your resources, so you can, there the API server can handle the conversion without calling out to webhooks, and it avoids a lot of these complex kind of operational risks. 
So it's really interesting work. It's very experimental. As you can see, it's in a pull request, not in a like merge branch. But uh, it's definitely worth checking out. And uh, yeah, over to Andreas to talk about validation and mutation. Yeah, thank you, James. So, well, I mean, conversion is one aspect of the uh, resources here, this life cycle. But as well, I, we're used like, to deal with uh, validating and mutating webhooks. Um, they generally, like validating webhooks are generally used like, to apply additional constraints, which cannot be expressed in the uh, in open API, in the open API specs for CRDs, like for instance, like even if we really advise not to do that, but some the state of some fields might be valid uh, depending on what other like properties are set on the CRDs. There is no good way like to do that with the schema itself. So at times this is like something that um, people need to resort to, and um, yeah, and but generally like the way we really like would like to. Um, pitch the idea of validating web books is really like as a way to do policy enforcement um, on, on the life cycle and what the user and the properties of this year, these resources that the user are supposed to be using. Um, it's really powerful because in the context of web books, and we will be seeing this later, you also know information about the users, like the namespaces, the service account and things like that, that you can really implement, use leverage to implement like uh, policies uh, based on who is the uh, client that is requesting, that is making the specific uh, um, creation of the CRD. At the same time, like mutating webhooks are um, are also like very flexible uh, mean to uh, apply additional changes on create and update. And the real like advantage of this uh, compared to, um, uh, to to the conversion webhook is also like that they uh, are not. Uh, um, executed on read operations. So like in terms of scalability, depending on the resource, very often like there are less uh, creations than the reads. So they, even if they have like some of the operational burden of that is common to all of the web books, uh, generally like there are more okay -ish way of dealing like with mutation in general. Um, if we look at web books in general, like, uh, a way more, like a um, good example of when this can be used is for instance like to uh, ensure that for instance in specific platforms depending on implementation that all the pods have a resource class set, right? Uh, sorry, a priority class set. Uh, this is a typical example of where this can be used, right? And this is something that is not enforced in the schema of the pod object, but for instance you can enforce like specifically to your platform. There are very nice uh, community tools that allow you to implement like uh, um, webhooks in, in both validating and mutating in your cluster, OPA, Kiverno are two of uh, example of projects. And the other thing that I believe like that is really powerful of webhooks is that they really like combine with the warning API, they allow you to provide like early feedback to users on the reason why for instance like a certain request was like forbidden and, and again like push left the feedback to the user rather than relying, for instance, on specific conditions like ready or errors uh, and having a validation after the resource is created. Um, <clears throat> of course, like, depending like, on for which objects we define these webhooks, like, they might come like, with uh, operational burden, uh, especially regarding to the scalability. Let's think about like, a webhook for pod objects. Like, this would be essentially like, consulted every time like, that a pod gets mutated. So, it's really like uh, the challenge with web webhooks is essentially that they are, they sit on the back of your API server and depending on the configuration, the API server might be dealing like with forwarding a lot of requests there. So they affect the end-to-end -end, like experience of the users with your API. Um, there are also like some challenges, like especially with uh, CRDs that are not that mature when we kind of like are still building the schema because we are learning about the resource or things like that that are related like to the lifecycle management of uh, uh, the webhooks, webhooks themselves, right? So um, it's really important to upgrade the webhooks before the CRD get upgraded, and at times this can be also like an operational challenge. Um, one thing that we want to mention, which is really interesting, I believe, is uh, um, this uh, cap, which is essentially like about, again, using cell in order to uh, move admission into the API. Um, we definitely think this is like an interesting feature because it allows essentially like to directly evaluate these rules and perform this uh, validation and mutation operation in the API without requiring like any extra component. 
Um, and again, like dealing with the scalability aspect, the latency, and the operational management of these additional components. So back to James on the testing methodologies. Cool. So yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about testing, like I say. Um, the one thing I say to begin with, with all of this, is really think about your API server testing versus your controller testing. So testing your APIs and then separately testing your controllers. They're obviously linked here, but it's really important. And I think we often don't actually see enough testing in APIs. Um, controllers kind of is where people go, and then that's that. So I'm going to go through kind of the different strategies for this, unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing with some examples. Um, so on the API server side, unit testing, um, has anyone ever in a ra like used the round, tri round trip stuff? Yeah, I can see one. Cool, two. Um, so yeah, basically this will generate completely random values for, like, of your objects, convert from one version to another version, and then make sure that they, it, the, the object's still the same. So it makes sure that it's completely like round trip, round tripable to use the word that it is, but um, it, it makes sure that your conversions are correct, basically. Um, and that's really, really important because if it's not, then if a user reads in one API version, uh, it, they might start getting different data. And especially with these conversion webhooks or any, any kind of conversion, to be honest, that can lead to a really confusing state for your cluster uh, and for your client. And that can really kind of start to break things again. And it will be subtle and you won't notice it and it will be horrible. Um, schema fuzz testing is a way to actually ensure that your schema is correct. So that's taking your like go type that you've defined, generating random values, and then applying your, gen your schema to that, to that type and to that generated instance of your type to make sure that we're not losing any data again. So that makes sure that's effectively applying things like the pruning uh, that the API server does um, and validation there to make sure that we, are, we have a complete schema that actually does account for all of the different fields uh, in your go type. Um, perhaps more obvious here, webhooks, that's firmly an API server side concern. Unit testing, make sure your validations and mutations have tests. I think they're possibly a bit simpler for us to think about. We can, you know, it's a more traditional thing here, uh, but make sure we're doing things right. There. Um, and another one that I really like is writing a corpus of actual valid resources and possibly some invalid ones too. Um, as we evolve things and make changes, you know, projects expand, new people come on board, it can be easy to accidentally make these mistakes. And just having that as kind of like a safety net there can really just give you a bit more confidence that we're not accidentally gonna, you know, change something and cause existing resources that users have already created to suddenly become invalid. Um, integration testing, so I, I think integration testing here for, um, it, we can make sure that basically things work. I think a lot of, a lot of the tests that we write for the API server side can be encompassed into integration tests. Um, basically making sure that we can create a resource in one version uh, and then read it in another. Really simple stuff, but like that will catch the majority, I think, of the issues that you tend to find. Um, defaulting, make sure things are set. Validation, make sure it says no if you said something wrong. Really, really kind of trivial stuff, but it, it's important because if we don't do this, that this is, you know, this is the whole point of the API, is to do these things. Um, and E2E testing, I tend to think E2E tests for the API side is more like, if I create this you know, webhook deployment, if I go and create this CRD, does it work? You know, have I specified the right ports on my thing? So that's far higher level, more operational sort of stuff, but yeah. Uh, and then yeah, things like RBAC2, we've got quite a few things to consider. Then on the controller side. Yeah, on the controller side, like, um, we are normally like we do write like Go test. If you use like for instance client Go and controller runtime, uh, you might be used like to interact with a fake client. Um, we normally like do testing starting from the reconcile function, which is the function that is handling all the uh, object events. Um, one of the uh, caveats that we found like with a uh, fake client is for instance that any I, we believe it's something that is very important like to do is that it's very hard like to simulate error condition of the API. What if the API is returning you 429, go away? How does your controller behave? What if it's returning you an error like on an update operation? This is something that is actually pretty hard like to model with the fake client. Uh, we often end up mocking the Kubernetes client in order to handle all of this potential error condition, but it's really an important aspect to make sure uh, 
about enforce and test the correctness of the behavior of the controller, which might lead also like to uh, scenarios in which, for instance, controllers are stuck, they cannot progress the reconciliation, or eventually like they back off too often, and, and therefore like you don't see like the uh, operation getting to an end. Or worse, uh, they don't back off at all. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, which is a real problem. Yeah. And actually, like something that is interesting about controller on time is really like testing the result. Like the, the result is what we do expect, right? Do we want to bake off in this case? Do we want to return an error so that like controller on time is handling for us the back off? Do we want to have a fixed retry window? What we, do we want to do? This is actually something very interesting, I think, to model as we, in order to build robust controller on top of the API. And, and while library that helps with that, I think is really like mTest, which is essentially a kind of evolution of uh, uh, the fake client in, in, in the Kubernetes uh, um, Go libraries, which really allows you to spin up like a real API server and an ETCD, uh, and as part of the execution uh, of your uh, test. And it's really powerful because it allows you like, to test all these aspects that exist in the API that otherwise would be in the API server that otherwise would be very hard like, to test. And if you look at some of the things that are happening like in the community, again, cell or webhooks or things like that, it's really allowing you to glue all of these things together and test the behavior of the controller with all these elements, not only like with the API resources themselves as they get created without all these add-ons. Um, really like, it's really lightweight. And this is something pretty incredible. And, and I definitely, I think this is must do for all the controller, like being able to test against the API without using like fake clients, like testing the real behavior of the API, as well as because the API evolves. There are new versions of the API server that come along and it's important to test the upgrade path. And this is the right way to do that. Not only updating the version of the libraries, but as well testing the real API server behavior. Um, the, last, the last thing, of course, again, about controller, e testing. As James said, like, e testing is mostly like a way to validate the behavior like of the controller in a, in a cluster, like with all of the other controllers that they might be interacting with, coordinating with. It's mostly like if, if I put like my SRE on, it's mostly like for us a way to make sure that everything still works as we do expect, that we don't break like the expectation of our users uh, when they create the resources and the controller get to handle them more than a real way to kind of like test in the development uh, life cycle like the controller behavior itself. It's mostly like something more targeted to the um, later feedback, which is the operational feedback. Uh, and, and also, as James pointed out, this is where we test our expectation about airbag permissions and, and interaction with other resources. Um, one thing that is important, especially like for our project, we often like kind of like provide hints and examples to the users on how they should be using like or they are expected to use the resources. It's important to keep testing them, like making the documentation always like actual. And this is something where again, it is can help a lot. So, few closing thoughts. Uh, we are about at time. Um, yeah, definitely rely on the schema as much as possible. And I like to say this again, rely on the scheme as much as possible because it's the simplest things you can do uh, and without all the complexity and operational burden of additional extensions like webhooks. Um, and regarding webhooks, really be mindful of uh, the impact uh, operationally and the cost of running them in the platform. They might evenly affect the customer experience that might be hard to maintain, hard to evolve, and and so really like, again, rely on the scheme as much as possible. Um, there is really like a lot of, there has been a very rapid evolution in the last years in the community about testing methodologies and uh, most of the code that out there use fake client, and test is now a thing, uh, really like revise your testing and, and make sure to use M test in order to cover more and learn of the aspect of the, of the controller interaction with the API and and as well, like, again, this is an area that M test is not covering. Make sure to test also the error condition and the behavior of your controllers in case of errors, back off 500, whatever error that the API is returning. M test, again, is not giving you any real helpers today to test like all of these error conditions. So this is where uh, you need to do extra work, uh, maybe mocking the client but do it because it's important uh, to ensure the resiliency of the controller and your code in production. Thank you.